So um, I might just start. A warm welcome also from my side to this first panel of this uh, great medical international conference on reconstruction. My name is Andrea Steinke. I'm a researcher at the Center for Humanitarian Action here in Berlin, and I have spent some time in Haiti during the past decade studying humanitarian aid and peacekeeping, and I'm very, very excited to be part of this um, panel and moderating this panel today. So um, as 60 minutes is very little time to discuss um, a context as complex as the Haitian one, I will not waste a lot of time repeating and countering all those um, toxic stereotypes that we have learned um, to watch and perceive Haiti with um, how, how um, the world talks about Haiti. Uh, just read an article in any German newspaper or any non-Haitian newspaper for that matter and you uh, know what I I'm talking about. So um, the theme of this conference um, is Haiti, um, is, is reconstruction. And Haiti had to reconstruct actually so many times uh, throughout its uh, history. Um, first of all, when the colonizers arrived, um, bringing about nearly three centuries of slavery to the island of Saint-Domingue. Then uh, we had the Haitian Revolution um, when, when it started um was followed by the foundation of the Haitian Republic in 1804 with the first modern state to guarantee universal human rights to everyone. Then the country had to be reconstructed after the Revolutionary War that has left big parts of the um, uh, of, of the island destroyed and the Republic of Haiti uh, economically and um, politically isolated. So um, also we had a situation that is um, not unlike what we are seeing uh, now when the first democratic election took place after after the ousting of the dictator president of La for, for Life, uh, Jean-Claude uh, Duvalier in the 1990s, Haiti had to be reconstructed. And um, also after 12 janvier in 2010, when an earthquake um, triggered one of the biggest disasters in, in contemporary history. So um, I'm just adding all of that uh, to make uh, you aware that um, on one and more on, on uh, more than one um, occasion, Haiti had to reconstruct itself, and Haitians had to reconstruct Haiti. They are kind of experts in reconstruction, not by choice but by structure. Um, since we have started um, talking about this conference, the events in Haiti have unfolded, foreseeable to those uh, who either live in Haiti or follow follow the events closely. So um, the constitutional term of Haitian president-elect uh, Jovenel Moïse has ended um, on Sunday, February 7, yet um, he refuses to leave office. Um, a situation that is interpreted differently by uh, different actors. Almost every uh, civil society organization in Haiti, the Supreme Council of the Judiciary, um, the Federation of Haitian Bar Association, the Catholic Church in Haiti demand um, Weiss to step down, while um, at this uh, point of time the U.S. and the United Nations are officially backing him. So um, we will take some time to discuss this urgent and very present recent developments in Haiti to then... Um, give every speaker the opportunity to share um, his or her experience um, and expertise on Haiti. So um, to discuss, I am immensely grateful and honored to have with us today uh, Nixon Bumba in Paul Prince, uh, Mark Schuller in um, Chicago and Katja Maurer in um, Frankfurt. I will give everyone a proper introduction when it's his or her time to speak. So. Um, we will start with Nixon Bumba. Nixon Bumba is a Haitian human rights activist, um, a journalist, and a member of several social movements, most prominently um, of the Collective Justice Mean on IT, the Haitian Mining uh, Justice Collective, ensuring that Haitian people understand their rights in regard to extractive industries. He has been um, Shell Center Visiting Human Rights Fellow at Yale Law School and has studied among other issues, issues of gender and sexuality in the context of humanitarian aid. He also um, works for the American Jewish World Service in Haiti. Um, a warm welcome uh, to you, Bumba, today. Um, could you please give us an update on the current situation in Haiti? And um, hello to Paul, thanks. Merci, Andrea. Bonjour, bonjour tout le monde. Et... Thank you very much, Andrea. And 
Hello, everybody. Andrea said she feels honored having us as guests, and I, in fact, feel very honored having been invited to this conference, which uh, is focusing on the reconstruction of the world. First of all, first of all, we must say that, in fact, for a long time we've been asking ourselves whether it's not necessary to recreate the world. And we're saying that we need to change the system for this. In today's reality, it becomes clear that the system, the system which uh, was against the existence and the will of this small island with only 11 million inhabitants, which uh, was characterized by colonialism and slavery and rule by the army, without uh, taking these people into account, and the, the system needs to be changed, because the most uh, essential human rights are refused from us, and we have been living in this current situation for nearly three years with the scandals and with corruption. We know that corruption uh, really belongs to the historical roots of our country. However, however, with the most recent unrest in 2018, it has become clear how widespread corruption is. We've met with great support from the population for this attempt at changing society, at changing the government in our country, and to have uh, human rights respected, after all. And like in colonial times, we're being exploited. We do not have the right to self-determination. We do not have the ideal for which we made the revolution at that time, for determining ourselves and living in freedom. At the moment, there is a very powerful social movement which is able to challenge the government structures which were erected against the will of the Haitian nation and was imposed on us. We have cultural rule, roots, but we also have an economic model of our own. But uh, the population is not able to enjoy the fruits of the economy of the country. This movement, this powerful social movement, has now established some international contacts and is now putting into question the power situation and the class situation in our country. This movement has become strong. We have more than 4 million inhabitants in the country. We were able to mobilize. At times, we have had demonstrations with more than 1 million participants, and there is more and more opportunity during which the people themselves are taking over power. There are very many demands. Above all, we demand access to social justice, to historical social justice. The rural population, the women, are trying, are trying to realize themselves within the economy. Over the last three years, the differences between the different strata of society have become much clearer again, but we also want to have some transparency so that we can really unveil the corruption scandals and can really hold those responsible accountable. We know that development aid, international development aid, 
has also led to certain dependencies. A lot of funds were given, but they did not really get through to those in need. So there is corruption in this respect as well. And there is this powerful demand by the people that those who are responsible at the government level will in fact be held accountable. In 2020, more than 350 people were killed during uprisings. And the response was massive repression. And it has meant that more and more gangs are forming outside the cities and uh, that are slowing down development and that of course has impact on the lives, on the day-to-day -day lives of people. It's been said again and again that power needs to be shared, that there should be a certain control of power, but this does not exist. And there is no way for us to really make the justified demands of the people heard. Fighting against corruption is what we want. We want uh, that the petro thieves, as we are calling them, are being tried. We want the system in Haiti to be changed. What does this mean? It means that there is a lot of work ahead of us. Changing the system, this is uh, what we hope for. So these historical roots being rooted in colonialism need to be cut. The most important representatives of Western European countries and some countries of Latin America have maintained these. But we want a social future. We want the basic rights to be respected. Today in Haiti, everything needs to be built by the middle class, as we call it. There are no real links between the different groups of society. If at all, you meet around the schools, but actually each group in society is uh, very much isolated from the others. We don't know how we can change all of this and how we can reconnect again with our ideal of self-determination so that we can produce ourselves in order to cover our needs without being exploited and without working for people we don't have any relationship with. The international community of peoples, if we can speak of it, it doesn't really exist, there is no community at an international level. There's only a community of the ones with power who are prescribing for us how to act, what to do. We need to provide cheap labor and we need to supply bananas, for example, to Germany. Sorry. For, for, for this comparison, I would like uh, to apologize to all my German listeners, it's just an example. The colonial logic behind this still prevails. It's a patriarchal logic and racism is also a problem for us. We're being treated with racist vocabulary. And this is something that we do not want to accept anymore from the international community. We're demanding this, and this is a humanitarian matter. We're demanding to really be respected, to really be liberated, so that we can live the way we want to live. I hope that this has given you some insights in the situation we are living in today at ha in Haiti. Practically, we've had an interruption, a suspension of democracy because we don't have a president. A president has been elected, but he cannot take office. There is a leg 
legitimate demand that the president resigns from his office or makes free his office and uh, makes place. But there's also this position of the international community which says it's a conflict between different political camps, but it's much more. It's about how we want to live together, how society should be shaped. This is what we're, what we're demanding. Over the last four months, we've had uh, some kidnapping actions or things like this practically every day. It's the order of the day. And of course, uh, for people in Haiti, this is a nightmare. People are kidnapped, people are caught, policemen were abducted. As I said, gangs are gaining more and more space in the public. There's a gang called Genève terrorizing everybody and demonstrating continuously and uh, even killing policemen who in turn are responsible for massacres. So this is the context. This is the context uh, which I am talking about but which probably cannot be resolved as long as I'm living, but we're not giving up hope. At the moment, we're reliving the same situations which we've had before. The legal system is completely corrupted. The police appear nearly like a paramilitary unit taking illegitimate, illegitimate action and not helping the population they are supposed to help. It is really a very difficult situation, a situation which is very, very difficult for people, even for those selling vegetables or fruit or wanting to buy them. This is hardly possible because the gangs and the terrorist uh, gangs acting like military are threatening them. I would like to thank all of you who are listening would like to thank you for your solidarity. We need this solidarity in order to make known the situation in Haiti. Not just to make it known, but to make it clear that we do have a certain demand for changing this system, for changing this system which makes us sick, not just on Haiti, a system which is also making Germany, France and the US and all other countries are affected by it. The structure in Haiti at the moment, I would first of all uh, like to tell you, please uh, continue to call out uh, international actors and please also uh, don't spare the Germans and their need for uh, Haitian bananas. It's the right thing to do. And um, I would like to ask you one, one, one more question, um, because next uh, to your other activities, next to your activities um, in social movements, you also work for an international NGOs. Do you think there's a way of, of, of joining forces, of, uh, um, of, of reforming the system in this uh, position in a way? Je pense qu'aujourd'hui, être présent à cette conférence, ça traduit. I think, I think that the, the fact that today I can participate in this conference shows that we're able to work together, that we're not alone. All this context of the conference reminds us of the fact that it's simply necessary to bring about a paradigm change and to change the system. We do not feel in isolation when we can network here today. It doesn't make any sense to work in isolation as a Haitian or as a German or as any other type of organization. Of course, we need to cooperate. This is simply what is demanded from us today. I do work for an NGO and uh, when I started with this work, 
maybe it was a bit of a contradiction with my life. This NGO contributes towards depoliticizing the social relationships so that we really focus on Haitians, so that they really become the focus of their own lives and of their own social organization. And this NGO tells us that we, in fact, should form the government. Because uh, we do not need any paranational governments, but certain functions, certain functions need to be delegated to others. And if we do so, this means that relationships are depoliticized, as I've said, and it means creating a power structure in response to the political problems within this country. So when I was involved, this was only for three months, and I simply wanted to do something different. When I started, when I started cooperating, working there, I found that it is, in fact, possible to change something, that, in fact, you can support social movements. And if I'm to work in an organization like this, then I must see ways in helping, of helping my country. I've helped a lot. I've learned a lot from this work for the NGO. It's been an interesting experience. And I suppose the same applies to the NGOs, well, to all types of NGOs, really. This kind of work needs to be interconnected and networked as widely as possible. I see this as a privilege, receiving support for projects and help at how grassroots initiatives can be supported, how small-scale initiatives can be supported from many diverse small communities. These are things that we need to do in future, and I'll certainly continue doing this. I'll exchange very often with all of you because this will really advance us. We do want this change, and we want to discuss about how to reduce dependencies. how we can make progress in building our future. To people in Haiti, but um, to people um, um, in other parts of the world, in Germany as well as in the United States. Thank you so much, Boomba, for, for this uh, first insight. Um, I would like uh, to turn to Mark now. Um, I will give him a short introduction. Mark Schuller is an anthropologist uh, with uh, more than two decades of experience in the humanitarian sector in, and um, its effects in Haiti. He is chair of um, anthropology nonprofit and NGO studies uh, at Northern Illinois University in Chicago and a fellow at the Faculty of Technology at the University of Haiti um, and the current president of the Haitian Studies Association. Um, his research on humanitarian aid in the aftermath of uh, the earthquake to Janvier um, had been wide, uh, widely noted uh, and received beyond um, scholarly uh, circles. And um, his uh, latest book is called uh, Humanity's Last Stand Confronting Global Catastrophe, um, that I happened to have to purchase uh, this um, which also talks about um, new ideas and new networks of solidarity. Um, Mark, from your perspective, uh, what is that at on uh, Boomba's analysis that we have just? Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to come and share a panel with uh, with Boomba, who's a fantastic and very dynamic organizer on the ground. Um, we have been working together on a couple initiatives to try and signal boost um, 
the issues from the analyses from from people who are movement actors on the ground and also people that are excluded from from the conversation the poor majority the peasants the youth um the uh people living in the with the sh what we, in the english it's translated as shanty towns or, or popular neighborhoods so um uh, I just recently published an uh, article in NACLA that explains the foreign roots um, of the contemporary crisis. Um, so I'm not Haitian, and I'm, uh, I'm not being asked to opine on the situation in Haiti. I'm not being asked to support a particular position uh, in Haiti. What I'm asked to do is um, to, to what would they say, so look at my own government. Um, so what is my own government, the United States, um, the center of the neoliberal regime, uh, the, you know, the, the center, uh, the current center of empire. Um, I have a responsibility to interrogate what that role is. Um, how does U.S. foreign policy reproduce um, Put a, you know, put a thumb on the scale of justice in Haiti to set the conditions for people in Haiti not having an opportunity to make a decent living. Um, so it is a global eco capitalist economy built on plantation slavery. Um, that is, you know, if we still need to remember that that is this, that's it is a long term struggle. It is not a contemporary, you know, even to use the word neoliberal. Um, it's, it goes deeper than that. The, the struggle that we're facing now as humanity, um, and thank you, Andrea, for that shout out, is about uh, climate change, is about um, so our survival of our species. And if we don't think of it in those terms, we're going to fall short of liberation. Um, so Haiti is a place that I've worked since, you know, for 20 years now. Um, and I've had uh, the privilege of meeting folks like Boomba and others who are pushing me to be accountable to them uh, in my research. So um, I'm asking your second question first, because I think it's useful. Um, so um, what, the work that I do in Haiti, I was gonna start my uh, timer, I didn't, sorry. Um, the, my role is to look at um, how people are experiencing their, their own lives, uh, how, how they understand the structures, the reward structure, you can call it, um, you could call it, um, you know, at Avish Jatika in the keynote for HSA called it a punishment structure. It's, you know, um, how people make do with what they're given. So people do have free choice, um, but they're not given the same opportunities. And so the reward structure reproduces certain behaviors that we don't, uh, that are anti-humanistic, that are anti-human rights, that are anti-democratic. And um, so our role in solidarity is to, change the rules of the game so that people have a chance to actually know what kind of government they want to live in, name what kind of country they want to live in. That was part of the Jubilee campaign in 2009 that, can that canceled Haiti's debt. Um, because if you're paying debt service, you're not paying for education, you're not paying for health care, you're not paying for uh, support for the environment or for agricultural development. So the, the one concrete thing we can do is look at specifically how our, how our governments, how the, the international institutions that our governments are participating in, like Germany is a, is a big member of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Uh, Germany is a member of the core group. Um, and Germany, like the United States, has a, has a privileged position within the global capitalist economy. So it's the economy that's, um, that is driving these uh, inequalities and the, the lack of opportunities uh, for people to make a decent living in places like Haiti. Um, so we need to look at where our economy is doing. Um, so the solidarity ties are deeper than our government ties. The seed company that's destroying uh, the, the, the fields in Haiti and making Asian peasant farmers unable to survive is the same seed company that my, uh, my mother's hometown is displacing people and they're now tenant farmers, essentially, um, in rural Minnesota. So uh, if you're looking at what, what's happening in Haiti, there, you know, there are investors and in who's funding this. Um, so the Clinton Global Initiative, yes, we need to talk about the Clinton Global Initiative and the uh, what um, Jonathan Katz called the king and queen of Haiti, uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton, uh, in their role in disaster capitalism in Haiti uh, after the earthquake in 2010. Yes, we need to talk about that, but those of us who have mortgages, those of us who have student loan debt, those of us who buy 
um, clothing that's made in, in places like Haiti, we have a seat at the table that we're not sitting in. So we need to be more active. Uh, my research has been on NGOs. Um, and so I'm not just looking at the political stage. NGOs do, have played what, um, a role in what I, uh, activists in Haiti like Bumba call the humanitarian occupation. That decisions are being made um, for reconstruction, uh, but also in just basic human rights and human, human needs by foreign actors. Um, that um, if you look at the, the NGOs, and beyond just the, the, the political stage, NGOs have rendered Haiti more dependent on foreign aid and more dependent on, um, on foreign imports um, in particular. And um, so just a quick recap of the last book, Humanitarian Aftershocks, uh, it is, uh, aid is also the second disaster. Um, where I was in Haiti eight days after the earthquake and people were definitely traumatized, but they were also very organized in, in, in most specific solidarity. They put away their class differences, they put away their political differences, they put away their religious differences in a common project to collectively survive. Um, so. They had a, you know, as an example, I had some funds to buy a, a truck of water. And um, before I was told I could pay for it, I was so, so let's make sure we actually have the capacity to um, to receive this donation. Um, so people in the neighborhood, about, about 80 people got together and they had a list. Okay, this person has this pot, this person has this bucket, this person has this vessel that can carry water and they calculated that they could in fact receive it. So really quickly in, in a matter of a couple hours, people were able to distribute, um, to, to say that we can do this. And this system of bottom-up solidarity that just saved Haitian lives, you can document another article that talks about how the Haitian people are the first responders. We need to remember that. They're not just mouths to feed, they're not just people that have needs, they're people that have the intelligence and have capacity. So the humanitarian occupation of Haiti um, took all of this Haitian capital and removed it. Um, people were forced to work for uh, foreigners who don't speak their language, who don't know the country, and are maybe half their age. And beyond the, the high profile scandals like Oxfam sex scandal that broke seven years after it occurred in 2018, or the Red Cross of the United States scandal that broke in 2015, beyond these spectacular media profiles, this aid system creates a, a culture of internal colonialism where people that make decisions are the ones that know what's going on systematically. So as a result, for example, um, the backbone of solidarity is a family structure. So if the same bag of beans and rice is given to a family of two or a family of eight, what you just did is you you, you did in, in two years what took uh, two generations in Western Europe and the United States to reduce the family size from five to three. If you're interested, I can give you data. More, more importantly, these uh, the solidarity was replaced with this top-down camp committees that were that were products of and, and reproduced little mini miniatures of NGOs, and these were top-down, male-dominated, and unaccountable. Many of them were gang members or, or pastors that they were trying to just speak one word of English or Spanish or German, so they became the leaders and they had no accountability to the people. What they did. Uh, with this aid is uh, is shocking. Um, so a small arms uh, survey report said that 22% of women reported being victims of sexual assault in 2010 in the camps. This compares to 2% outside the camps. This is a, not a, a function of, of Haitian people's natural proclivities. This is a pr production of the humanitarian aftershocks. This is what happens when you give men all the power to decide who receives aid and give women that aid. So transactional sex became huge and this became much more important when there was a $500 rental assistance. So this is the most shocking example. Aid actually, it destroys families, disrupts the solidarity networks and increases violence against women. And this is what people that are just normal everyday folks trying to do their, their thing. Thank you very much, Mark, um, for for this insight on on your studies and your research and also your activism. Um, now, uh, Katya is in a very uncomfortable position to be speaking for an international internationally active um, NGO. Um, I'm going to introduce you uh, briefly. Um, Katja Maurer is a journalist and an editor-in-chief for the Medical Newsletter. She is a trained interpreter and translator and headed the public relations department of uh, Medico International 
uh, for many years. In her journalistic work, she regularly regularly deals with um, political developments in Latin America, especially she publishes on um, Israel-Palestine and on the topic of um, multi-perspective memories. Since um, the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, she has written on the country's history and present and um, co-authored the volume Haitian Renaissance, The Long Struggle for um, Post-Colonial Emancipation. So, um, dear Katja, Medico International is an NGO. Uh, there is no way around it. So, um, let's talk business. Um, first of all, please um, introduce, uh, give us a little bit of an idea of what Medico is doing in Haiti before uh, re and deconstructing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Yes, let me take this opportunity, nevertheless, to say that as an aid organization, now after what Mark just said, you definitely cannot stand up here and start presenting projects. That would mean that we would pretend that we have a recipe up our sleeve with which we can tell you this is how you need to do it and everything will be better. But that's the very problem. In Haiti, what we've seen, and for me, I was something who was part of this for 10 years, it was a great shock. We saw how this idea of being able to save a country from the outside can have disastrous impacts. And it's really difficult as an aid organization to have to make it clear that the kinds of projects that donors are envisaging cannot be implemented. Normally, it would be our business to present a project, something that makes sense to those who uh, donate money, and then it will help. It will be helpful, but that's the very thing that triggered the disaster in Haiti that Mark Schuller was just talking about. For us, to see a project culture in Haiti that is projects that are based on donors' wills. And um, these projects were not only carried out after the earthquake, they've been around since the 90s. Haiti is considered as the republic of the NGOs, of the foreign NGOs that uh, basically um, took away the country's own resources and uh, strength. Let me give you one example. As viewers, as listeners now, when you think of Haiti, what would you do? And I can tell you what you probably will think of as a privileged white person. You'll think of the poor Haitian children. And then what happens next? Well, if Trump had been re-elected, now we would have a uh, vice president who happens to even have adopted a Haitian child as a proof of her moral integrity. So that is the white post colonial look at Haiti. Haiti. The most popular projects are those involving children. There are orphanages. There are more orphanages than there are orphans. Fortunately, the children afterwards return to their families. So if you look at what happened uh, post-earthquake, it's even more disastrous. 40,000 NGOs were present in Haiti and completely out of control. I wrote a book, as mentioned by Andrea Steinke, in which I did try to recapitulate all that. And it is my hope that quite possibly um, I'll end up with the NGOs, my own origins, and be able to say it wasn't as bad as all that. But what did the NGOs end up doing? 40,000 NGOs in a country with 10 million inhabitants. They went all over the place, and they felt that there's nothing here unless we do something. So they didn't do the very thing that Mark talked about. They didn't resort to what was available on site. Rather, the projects wanted by the donors, by what seemed sensible to white donors, was imposed on Haiti, and that is how they invaded the very innards of that country, uh, disempowering it. And I think it is not exaggerated to speak of uh, humanitarian occupation. So, what can be done as an NGO that is trying to do political work, after all, and to uh, explain and teach? In Europe, we have created a group called Stop the Silence on Haiti. What we must try and do is to take our little influence that we have here and to try and make sure that the support for the president uh, stops, because both the EU and Germany are part of the so-called core group, the group that decides 
about everything in Haiti, funding specifically, and they are still supporting a completely illegitimate president who himself clearly is enmeshed in cases of corruption and, and has brought gangs uh, to, to power. So making noise regarding the situation in Haiti, I believe, in fact, is more important than uh, pretty little help projects that can be sold well to donors. Now, of course, we are cooperating with partners. There's no other way with Nixon or with partners such as the Human Rights Network in Haiti that uh, uh, the, there's been support for many years an organization that was trying to um, manage, control international aid after the earthquake. Uh, they issued no great numbers of studies and they showed that 80% of the uh, funds coming from the U.S. actually returned to the U.S. There are no such figures for Germany available, but a lot of the funds were returned or did go back. Now uh, there are, is, are uprisings in Haiti and I'm being t asked as a so-called expert on Haiti and I'm expected to listen to just how corrupt Haiti is when really you have to say the corruption is on our side too. I agree with Mark, it is our job to really point the finger at our very own governments. And uh, it is, Haiti is being left alone. It is uh, swept under the carpet what we have done there. There really ought to be a turnaround regarding everything that we consider to be aid and that we'll probably be discussing here. This is um, critical insight into the workings of, um, of uh, the NGO sector, but also of your um, um, own organization in it. As I understood, um, your your way forward would be that of advocacy. Um, I would like to open um, the, the, the panel um, to all the three of you now to discuss exactly this. Now we have heard Bumba, we have heard Mark and, and, and Katja talk about uh, what uh, um, didn't work so well, to put it uh, euphemistically, in, 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 uh, in the past uh, 10, 20, maybe 200 years in Haiti. Um, so what, what would be the alternative? No? I mean, there are some NGOs who would say that what they do is solidarity work. You know, if there's an earthquake, of course you want to help people. You know, you want to help people to survive. So what is there to change? You know, what has to change in the way this solidarity works? Um, um, I would like uh, to give uh, Nixon Bumba the opportunity to um, go first. Well, thank you. I'm happy about what Mark and Katya said about the issue of Haiti. I think we, all of us, need to look for alternatives for the whole world and all over the world, for the reconstruction of the world. So how can we organize relationships in a new way in the world and within Haiti and between Haiti and the world. You just need to look at how globalized capitalism used and utilized Haiti. We need to look for alternatives altogether. And we need to be aware, first of all, what has changed in this world and why it has changed and what is happening at the moment, what developments have taken place over the last 10 years and what exactly the relationships are between Haiti and Germany, Haiti and Europe, whether these relationships are to remain the same at a macro level between governments, but also in cooperation on projects with the poor family, with the disenfranchised families. We need to look at these things from a certain distance in an analytical way. And everybody has to ask themselves questions and we are trying to make our own contribution ourselves and of course to liberate ourselves to some extent in this way and to free ourselves from those heroes who are trying to liberate Haiti. Many contributions are no contributions towards justice and development. 
Haiti itself has built a new humanity. We, the black people of African origin, were kidnapped by the, kidnapped by the system. Systems were imposed on us. We were not perceived as humans. We were not treated like people. We were animals used for work, not people. We did not have any rights to that that others were entitled to. And this is what we need to start with, with this justice. And this also means breaking with the current structures. And then, of course, it also needs take some pressure on governments in Europe, in Germany, in France, and in the US. Can we allow them to be as dominant as so far, dominating whole countries through corrupted governments? It's a world of different speeds. Colonialization on the one hand by uh, governments vis-a-vis -vis countries like Haiti that have never been fully recognized throughout their whole histories. And also pressure from below. Farmers from Germany who could do something together with uh, farmers from Haiti or could think about solutions for us along with farmers from the US or wherever. Looking for alternatives, also alternatives for capitalism. Because at the moment there's only this logic of capitalism today. And alternatives are also needed for colonialism and productivism. With people dominating nature, with humans dominating nature, which has caused one part of the problems we're experiencing in Haiti. Today, we're in the situation in which we get to feel the impact of climate change massively. Many people had to leave Haiti, had to go to other Latin American countries because of this. And the brutality and the cruelty of these developments, how they're happening now, this can be seen today in Haiti. Climate change is causing big problems in uh, the everyday lives in Haiti, worldwide, of course. And it's also about freedom, the freedom of people, the rights of people, the diversity, the tolerance, the equal treatment, the equal rights in the decisions that are taken for the future when looking for solutions and alternatives that would really put people in the center and not capital and not power and not honor or respect, but justice and solidarity. And this, this search for solutions, this is what we need to undertake together. Nobody can claim that they know everything, that they've already had the solutions. Thank you for, for, for this um, um, input, uh, Bumba. I would like now to come to um, Katja to, um, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it came out of surprise, um, you know, because um, I don't want to repeat myself. Of course, it's very important not to silence Haiti. I think there's a lot of things that are said about Haiti. It's, uh, in my view, um, the wrong things that are in the wrong narratives or narratives that are not very helpful that are um, going to that are distributed throughout the world. Um, and um, again, to your position as, um, as an international NGO, who actually um, is in contact with all those actors that uh, um, Bumba has just mentioned. Oh, like especially also with the German government and coordinating uh, its intervention and so on and so forth. So, um, what? How could we bring this uh, idea of solidarity just mentioned by 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 Bumba to actually to practice as a member and for for you as a, as a person, but also for you as a member and representative of this entity? I think there is. I think for aid itself, we do belong 
to this and I'm working on this, it means that we need to redefine aid in the context of solidarity and not as a feudal institution trying to cushion the damage left behind by the global market. That is, we need help again that is politicized and that understands that it's about solidarity. And we are mandated to take along our donors. That is, we are trying to make it clear what the causes are. This is also what this conference is about. And as far as Haiti is concerned, we need to give them so much because Haiti is the country that has realized human rights first. And this is something that needs to be recouped. We will hear, I think, Bembe, and he has this idea of repair. And repair is obvious when we look at Haiti. Repair means reparation. Haiti had to take out debt and pay this debt back for, 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 for the uh, wages of slavery that they never received. So Haiti was uh, under this debt, and this debt needs to be repaid. And this would be a way of decolonializing our relationship with Haiti. This would be central. Aid, if it understands itself in a different way, is not only accountable vis-a-vis -vis the donors, those who put up the funds, but also towards those who receive the aid. This is also part of our responsibility. We need to be aware of this. The UN was not held accountable for bringing cholera to Haiti, for occupying the country. American corporations were not held accountable for running threadbare projects in Haiti, only for enriching themselves. This list is endless. And the NGOs were not held accountable for doing more for themselves than for Haitians. So we need to invert this accountability. A project, I think, which will be the future, is that we need some sovereignty of Haiti over food and support for achieving this. Haiti is among the five countries most affected by the climate disaster. And food sovereignty, instead of flooding the country with food from abroad, would be a way, a way for many, for building their own self-determined existence. So things need to change, and then aid can play a role if it sees itself not as aid business, but as a task of solidarity. Comment. We um, started a little bit late, so I'm uh, taking the opportunity to uh, go a little bit over time as well. So uh, please, Mark. Um, Be as brief as I can. Thank you. Brief. I will. Uh, so Haiti is a graveyard of NGO projects. Um, despite good intentions, it didn't act. Uh, the actions did not lead to the transformation. So why is this? I mean, what can we do in solidarity? If you're People in Haiti are talking about ngo in and not NGO as a structure, so it, it's a verb. And if you look closely at the, 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 the constraints that, that make uh, development and humanitarian aid less effective, they're the same constraints that make solidarity NGOs less effective. Uh, so it's the need to, uh, it's the logic of the project. You know, if you're, if you're trying to show that you're doing something by having petition signatures, that's not actually transforming society. It, it, it's still the logic of the photo op that, that has destroyed humanitarian responses. Um, if you're not centering the work of transformation, if you're not centering the voices, like specific real living people with real concepts, with real priorities, with real um, constraints on their understanding, but also like real like hopes for what's going to happen next. Like if you, if, how does the work of solidarity translate to action? I mean, that's that you got to be really constantly self-critical. The self-critique allows you to remind yourself that this is that the action and the outcome is is more important than your than your intention. And you know, um, particularly now when when global white supremacy um, is um, behind the 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 treatment of Haiti. We just, the United States sent three um, deportation flights in a day 
uh, this week. Uh, it, was a, it was a Democrat. This wasn't Trump. You know, so we need to. You know, so the when people ask what can we do, you know, those of us who are, have the privileged position to be intermediaries, uh, to be going back and forth, need to do their homework. And if you're not able to do your homework. Uh, by actually learning the language and, and, and visiting and, and finding out what's happening in Haiti, then doing your homework to what is the minimum standard. So if, you wanna, if you're interested, you can maybe handwrite a check and handwrite uh, a note saying, I'm interested, but I need to see these more things on your, your website. Who's making the decisions? What relationship did you have before the crisis? Um, who are the partners on the ground? How are you making yourself accountable to the local populations? What is the participation plan in real terms, not just a check the box? You know, the, the, what actors in Haiti were calling the new minimum standards of aid. That, um, so the, there's a list that uh, came out of an article about Hurricane Maria in, in Puerto Rico. It's not only unique to Haiti, but these new minimum standards need to center human dignity. Um, in a place where uh, the movement of Black Lives Matter started in 1804, and why it was punished for that, you know, precocious demonstration of, of centering of humanity, I think that's important to to quickly reverb around the question of universalism. And to say humanity is the center of the of the struggle is not a top-down universalism, but it has to start with the messy specificities and cultural realities of people on the ground in Haiti. So what they're talking about in terms of humanity is contingent on their dehumanization. And so that needs to be centered as does the, the interrogation of our own pro, uh, privilege as those of us in the global north, those of us who have white privilege, those of us who have male or cisgender privilege, but particularly in Haiti, those of us who have the privilege of looting an empire. Um, we need to interrogate. There, people in Haiti are not asking us to, to Change, you know, to get involved in the politics of Haiti, that they are asking us to transform our, our institutions so that uh -huh. institutions that are acting supposedly in our name actually do. And so that new solidarity economy is, it can be a way forward. But in the meantime, you know, urgent political action is necessary to transform our institutions from within. Merci, Mark. Um, I would like to give Abumba the last word. Um, in so far as to what uh, we have just heard uh, from from your colleagues in, in Germany and the US, does it uh, satisfy you? What is more? Well, I see it exactly the same way. I absolutely agree with what Katja said what she said about the way towards alternatives for Haiti. Food sovereignty and environmental issues, environmental protection, creating jobs so that a life in dignity is possible is important. If you really want to look for alternatives and really want to implement them and the Western Governments, if we also want to have them on board so that they're not continuing to, to treat Haiti like a small colony, then uh, you also need to listen to the population, need to involve them, to include them in international cooperation. And look where, the, where, where all the money went that was sent to Haiti, whether it really got through to people and really be an opposite number for the people of Haiti themselves and to hear from them what it's like in Haiti. And this human side in, at the center, this is exactly where we need to look for alternatives. And of course, without this differentiation or separation between blacks and whites or North Americans and South Americans and Europeans, but to focus on the human side and people who are really enriching each other from one country to the other and across borders. In order to achieve this solidarity, not just uh, this bourgeois solidarity, this uh, somewhat condescending solidarity, but the real solidarity. It's been very interesting, this discussion I've been very happy to be able to tell you a little about Haiti.
and uh, to speak about our struggle in favor of liberation and emancipation. You're listening today uh, um, that it's the imperative to put humanity at the center, and then everything else will uh, will um, come from there. Because otherwise, um, we have seen what happens if we don't uh, put humanity first. So. Um, to all of our panelists, um, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, to uh, Nixon Bumba, merci, merci um, Mark Schuber in Chicago, and um, Katja Maurer in um, Frankfurt. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure. Um, I think we've learned a lot, and I really hope that we uh, can continue this uh, conversation either um, through the internet uh, on other meetings or maybe also finding other means to uh, engage in, in the COVID, post-COVID times. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing all of you live again at some point. And um, I would now like to uh, blend into the next um, topic, which uh, to also share one uh, little uh, personal note of mine as well. Um, I have uh, happened to spend time in both places, both Lesbos and um, Haiti in my life, and I want to point out that um, it is not by chance or random that those two places are chosen as a paradigmatic place for discussing um, reconstructions. They are both situations on, on, on islands, and maybe not all of you know that, but um, um, in this situation that uh, all of you have pointed out uh, uh, already, um, the historical situation of uh, the democratic elections in the 1990s and then the um, the post-coup, uh, military coup violence that happened uh, forced many people to flee Haiti and um, they were actually intercepted on international waters um, by the U.S. authorities brought uh, to Cuba, held there um, in encampments that were called humanitarian camps to keep them from drowning. Actually, horrible human rights violations happened there. And um, it's all, both of those um, examples kind of show that there's a structure of the externalization of borders, of uh, migration aversion that is not so similar. I'm taking this moment to make the point to say uh, that what is happening today is not particularly new. The tools might change, but the, the dynamics uh, are kind of persistent. So let's not be overwhelmed with what Raul Peck has called this institutional amnesia, but let's learn from the past and like take take the past for granted and, 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 and learn our lessons um, for forging those futures together in, 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 in solidarities as individuals, as activists, but also something that um, everyone listening here from the NGO sector could, you know, bring back to uh, the tables of, of um, the next Zoom meeting at work. So um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, the next two days. Um, I think it's a, an amazing opportunity to exchange and um, um, looking forward especially to the next panel. Thank you so much everyone.